Hello. Hi, everyone. My name is John Weed. I'm going to be talking to you today about online learning in repeated auctions. This is joint work with uh, Vianney Percher and Philippe Bricolet, both of whom are here. Um, great. So when you hear the word auction, uh, maybe you think about going on eBay and picking up some hot new Magic the Gathering cards. Uh, maybe if you have slightly more expensive tastes, you think about your weekend spent uh, at art, art, art auctions spending uh, 100 million US dollars, which is the price for that painting. I cannot afford that. But uh, likely, if your tastes are really expensive and really exotic, you spend your weekend at the Chehalis Livestock Auction. Uh, I looked on their website earlier today, and they actually have cattle auctions every Saturday. So I appreciate you being here rather than there. Uh, as you imagine, given that we're at Colt, cattle auctions were our motivation for this problem. Of course, that's not true. This was our motivation for this problem, uh, this auction, or in particular, this auction. Uh, so online advertising is a, by now, $100 billion a year business, uh, and almost all of the major ad exchanges run on auctions in order to allocate where they're spending their money and how they put ads in different sites, on your phone, on your Google searches, uh, or uh, in your newsfeed. So, uh, so there's a particular model of auctions that is really theoretically popular and used in practice as well. It's called the second price auction. Uh, and here's how it works. So a bunch of bidders are bidding on a single good, uh, and we imagine they all submit sealed bids to some central seller. Uh, and the way the auction runs is that the person who submits the highest bid wins the auction, and the amount they pay is the second highest bid. So the highest bidder wins the item, the second highest price is, the second highest bid is the price they pay. So in these online auction contexts, these sort of auctions are being run repeatedly. Many different goods are sold in a repeated fashion. Each time a new set of sealed bids is submitted, the highest bidder is the one who wins, and the second highest price at each auction is the price paid. So these second price auctions have a lot of nice properties. Uh, in particular, they are what are called truthful auctions. So you may remember from your middle school auction theory class, this means that every bidder has a dominant strategy. And that dominant strategy is to simply submit their expected value for the item, how much they think it's worth to them. Similarly, on the seller side, this is a simple mechanism to use because the only knob that the seller has to turn is what reserve price should they set. In other words, below what price should no sale take place. But these are two quantities that in the traditional setting are easy to work with and easy to understand. Since we care about learning, the question is, what do we do on the bidder side or on the seller side when I don't have the information I need to make these optimal plays? So if I'm the bidder, Maybe I don't know what this item is worth to me. Maybe I've never bought it before or never seen it before. If I'm a seller, maybe I don't know enough about the bidders to decide what the right reserve price is. So the question is, in a repeated setting, can we learn this information from repeated auctions? So on the seller's side, this is actually a question that's been considered a number of times before. And there's a series of beautiful papers that say how the seller needs to learn the proper reserve price. Um, so this uh, 2013 paper by Chesa Bianchi et al. has a, a really nice algorithm in a regret framework for saying exactly how this should, how this should function from the seller's perspective. Um, and really all that needs to be learned is this reserve price. That's the only knob they have to turn. This talk will focus on the bidder's perspective. How can the bidder learn optimal play over the course of repeated auctions? And the challenge here from an information standpoint is that if I've never purchased the item before, I'm a naive advertiser, I've never bought an ad like this before, I don't even have a sense of what my expected value for this item should be. Moreover, I don't learn any information about how valuable the item is unless I actually buy it. Once I buy the ad and run it, I see how much it's worth to me. But before then, I don't have any information on which to make my determination. So this is going to be the focus on, of our talk. How does the bidder learn this information over the course of repeated auctions? So there's a nice trade-off here. This is a trade-off that's familiar to everyone at this conference, I'm sure. If I bid high, I'm more likely to win the item and more likely to get information about how much it's worth. But that's also potentially quite costly for me because I might overpay for an item that I didn't actually want. On the other hand, it's safer perhaps to bid lower, but then I don't get information about what the true value of the item is. So we have a sort of exploitation, exploration trade-off, and we have partial feedback. Sounds like a bandit problem, and that's how we're going to try to model this problem. 
So let's be a little bit more specific about the model. We imagine for convenience that all the bids are within the interval 0, 1. And here's what happens at round t. I, the bidder, submit a particular bid. This is how much I want to pay for the item. Simultaneously, a bunch of other bidders whom I don't see submit other bids. Now, one easy observation is that really the only thing we ever need to care about is the maximum of the other bidder's bids. That's the person with whom I need to compete who will set my price or who will beat me. So we'll call that MT for convenience. So I submit BT, the maximum of my adversary's bids is MT. If I bid higher than the other person's bid, congratulations, I win the item. I get it, it has some value that I can then understand, and I observe this. Uh, the amount I pay is the amount, that's, uh, that the amount that MT bid, the second highest bidder, the one just below me. On the other hand, if I do not win the auction, if my bid is lower than MT, then no money changes hands, at least not from my perspective, but I also don't learn a thing about how much this item was worth. How will we define utility in this context? Well, it's simple. These are random quantities, so we'll think about expectations here. But the only thing that I need to concern myself with is the gap between the value of the item I observe, that's VT, and the amount I paid for it, which is MT. But of course, this thing only exists if I won the auction in the first place. So if my bid is higher than MT, then the amount of utility I get is VT minus MT in expectation. We want to think about a regret framework. So we're going to be comparing this utility to the utility of the best fixed bid in advance. So we're going to try and understand the difference between these two quantities and ideally make them small. So the first one has a fixed bid that I, in retrospect, am able to set. And the second one is the bids that I make at each round T. Yes? So uh, we're, we remain somewhat uh, mute on that for the time being. So we'll say a little bit more about where that's coming from in a moment. Uh, and in fact, now is a time where we might say something about that. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'll pay you $20 afterwards for, uh, for your question. Um, so the first model we imagine is some sort of stochastic setup where there's some underlying distribution that these VTs are being drawn from, IID, with an expected value of V. Now what assumptions should we make on the other bidders? We don't want to necessarily make the assumption that they are also playing somehow randomly, stochastically. That's no fun if I imagine that for my auction. But I do want to imagine that they don't have any special access to the randomness at VT. So they're allowed to learn from the past as well, but conditioned on the past, MT should be independent of the value VT that happens at time T. This is a situation where the sellers don't give extra information to other bidders other than you. That's our stochastic setup. In the adversarial setup, though, we remove this extra assumption. We see maybe there is some collusion. Maybe MT has special access to VT, and VT is no longer necessarily random. So in this case, we don't make any stochastic assumptions. We even allow the bidders and the seller to collude. So let's talk about the stochastic model first. Let's try and understand this. We can do a little bit of uh, fiddling with this guy to get it into a slightly simpler form. The first thing is the VTs only appear in expectation here. And by assumption, conditional on the past, they're independent of everything that, uh, else that occurs in these expectations. So we can replace these simply by their expected value. Moreover, this maximization that occurs in the first term, well, we actually know what that maximum should be. That's what auction theory tells us. This is a truthful mechanism, which means that the best fixed bid is the true value of the item, uh, if this is the sort of bidding utility that I'm getting. So I can replace the BIC with just a V. So in the stochastic setup, this is the quantity that I want to bound. And in this setup, things are easy. It, in fact, just suffices to learn this expected value. That's what you would expect, right? I can get access to this expected value and do better and better over time. So we propose an algorithm that we call UC bid, named after the celebrated UCB algorithm of Lyon Robbins and Auer et al. Uh, and here's how it works. Uh, this bidder bids one the first time to win the item, just to win it. Uh, and then at subsequent rounds, they build an upper confidence interval. So they take the empirical average of values seen so far and add some slack that corresponds to an upper confidence bound. Uh, and that will shrink as the number of observations increases. So as more and more bids are observed, I get closer and closer to the true expected value of the item, and I do better and better. What's the performance of this algorithm? Well, um, the theorem we have is that the UC bid algorithm yields a regret bound that looks like this. So the first term to understand is log t over delta. Delta is a width of an interval 
above the expected value such that the adversary's bids don't fall in that interval. This, of course, becomes vacuous as delta shrinks to zero. We also get the gap-free bound uh, of root t log t. So this is the bound that we get for UC bid. Um, it's understandable that there should be some dependence here on this delta, because if the adversary is able to play slightly above the true expected value, get closer and closer to it every time, they can force you to consistently overpay for the item. So this log t over delta, you should understand the delta is appearing for that reason. Uh, but let's see if we can do something a little bit more subtle, if we do make some slightly more subtle assumptions about the gap above V. For instance, what if we replace the gap above V with some assumption about a density above V? So now we imagine instead that the adversary's bids are generated stochastically according to some density, and we make an assumption about the way that density looks above V. To be specific, we employ a margin condition, which says that the density assigns a certain amount of mass just above V. For values of alpha less than one, that means there's a lot of mass bunched right above the expected value. For values greater than one, we don't see much mass there. So we should expect less than one values to be harder because it's concentrated just above V and values greater than one to be easier. And indeed, we can pick this up in the rates. Uh, this algorithm gives the following set of rates under a margin condition. And the line to pay attention to is really the top one here. As alpha goes from zero to one, I'm smoothly interpolating between those two rates I saw on the previous page. When I'm at zero, I get root t log t, and when I'm at one or above one, I just get backs to logs. So this allows us to interpolate between those two rates we saw earlier. Moreover, these rates are optimal. We can show that there is a set of distributions such that any algorithm is going to incur a regret of this order up to log factors. So this algorithm does as best as we can hope in the moment. The adversarial setup is significantly more difficult. Uh, again, we don't have any assumptions on, M, uh, on VT and MT. They may even share information. And moreover, in this case, it is not just enough to learn the expected value. In fact, the performance of just the expected value alone can be arbitrarily bad. So that's not going to work as a strategy for this problem. One thing that we might do is try and take some out-of-the-box bandit algorithms we already know and apply them to this problem. Can we apply the X3 algorithm? Not a priori, because we have an infinite number of actions. But maybe we might hope, well, we can use some continuum bandits ideas or something like that. But that's not going to work here either, because our payoff function isn't Lipschitz. Uh, and any sort of discretization attempt doesn't work at all, in fact. So any naive discretization that we apply to this interval won't work. Let me give you an example of why that's so. Suppose that before the game starts, I set a certain discretization of the interval, and I'm planning on playing in, uh, on that discretization. Well, there's an adversary that can always force me to do poorly here. The adversary does, flips a coin. With probability one half, MT is just a hair above one of my discretization points, A plus epsilon for some small epsilon, and the value of the item is V. These are good auctions. I want to win them because the price that I have to pay is low, but the value is high. With 50% chance, though, the opposite is true. Instead, this guy is slightly below one of my discretization points, and the value is zero. These are bad auctions, and I want to lose them, because I would have to pay a lot for an item that's essentially worthless. But because he's playing between my discretizations, there's no place that I can play in this interval that manages to win only one type of these auctions. Either I'm winning both or losing both. And any algorithm is going to occur regret that's linear in T. So this sort of naive discretization doesn't give us anything, not even a slower rate at the beginning. We don't get sublinear regret here. What we need is something a little bit more clever. So we're going to try to discretize dynamically and use the fact that we see the opponent's bids to help us. So the opponent has made some bids in the interval before, and that cuts up the interval into a series of smaller intervals. We're going to view those intervals themselves as our actions. Playing on these arms, these actions, will mean playing uniformly in one of these intervals. So each of the pass bids of the adversary cuts up the interval, and by time t, I have maybe up to t different actions that come from having been cut up over time. What we're going to try to do is we're going to try to use a standard bandit algorithm on these intervals, but reweigh them dynamically according to their length. So to be slightly more specific, we're going to maintain at each moment a set of weights on each interval, and then whenever a new opponent maximum bid comes in, 
we're going to split the intervals that we had before and split the weights as well, repartitioning the weights proportional to the length of the intervals. So as the game progresses, we're building more and more actions and reapportioning more and more mass, more and more weights from the other actions into these new ones. So this algorithm, which we call exp3, after the x3 algorithm, if I hour at all, um, goes like this. We draw an action according to the weights. We split the interval when we see the adversary's bids and redistribute the weights. And then we update weights with estimated gains. So the real novelty here is this splitting and redistributing that allows us to smoothly grow the number of actions as the game continues. What sort of behavior do we get from this? So we get a regret bound that looks like root t log 1 over delta, where delta is the width of the interval containing the best fixed bid. So at the end of the game, there will be some interval between opponent's bids, and that uh, where, which contains the best fixed bid, and that width is going to be delta circle. Now you might note that this regret bound is perhaps a little unsatisfying, right? If delta circle is exponentially small, then this number could be linear. So we might wonder, is this dependence on delta circle necessary? And unfortunately, the answer is yes, that for any algorithm, there is an adversary that incurs regret of this form. So we can be forced to pay linear regret in the case where we have delta circle exponentially small. But in the case where we imagine that this adversary isn't trying to ruin us in particular, but just maybe colluding with the seller, it's reasonable perhaps to assume that they're not specifically trying to destroy our regret and that they're not playing exponentially close together, in which case we get a very nice rate here. Either way, it's optimal. So the takeaways from this are that we have matching and upper and lower bounds up to log terms for both the adversarial and stochastic settings for the, uh, for the strategies that we propose. Uh, and one interesting thing about the adversarial setting on the previous slide, I'll just note, is that this looks like a full information rate. We get log one over delta, log one over the smallest interval. So this is the full information rate that we would get with an optimal discretization in advance. So there's no price to pay here for the partial information. We have a lot of further questions we'd like to ask about the effect of covariates, about whether the advertisers have budgets, how that might affect their play, and finally, what game theoretic equilibria arise when a lot of people play with algorithms of this type. Thanks.